Uh, this meeting is being recorded. All right. I think um, we're good. All right. Sweet. What's up, Dad? How are you? Hey, Zach. Happy birthday. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Too. What? Big 22. Good job. Yeah, 22 today. Good, good day. Yeah. Hey, Chris, um, how's it going? How's what? it going? Okay. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Oh. All right. So let's get let's get into it. Just right away. I just want Dad, can you like just introduce yourself? Like who you are, so, like anyone who doesn't know know you personally, right? Or like with, like directly one of my close friends. Just yeah, go through go through it. Okay. Uh, my name's Rick Lynch. Known uh, first and foremost as being the father of Zach Lynch. Um, the uh, other part of my career, I've uh, been partner in a company called BLT Communications, which Bailey Lynch Titlebaum. I'm the L, I'm Lynch. We've been doing entertainment advertising, me specifically movie posters for the last 30 years with this company. And before that, I was doing it for five or six years with other companies. And prior to that, I was in a company that did album covers and I was the illustrator of that company. Then I learned how to be an art director, which was a big jump because I always wanted to be I always thought I wanted to be an illustrator, but then I realized being an illustrator, you're just hired as a as a risk to do execute other people, other person's ideas. But I was more of an idea guy, and I could draw in any kind of style from cartoons to photorealistic to you know stylized graphics. So um, I luckily was able to switch to being an art director and uh, started. Well, let's see, going way back to seventh grade, I was I sold my first drawing of a car, a hot rod car, for like twenty five cents. Uh, that's okay. me on the road where I started copying photos. I, well, actually, I, when I moved to Lake Havasu after my folks divorced and we took off without my dad down to Lake Havasu from the San Francisco Bay Area, there was really nothing to do down there. And and that was they, when you were like 11, right? Or how, how old were you? Yeah, so middle was, school? Was, uh, 10 going on 11. I turned yeah. 11 that, that summer and uh, moved from Walnut Creek, California, where uh, I was adopted at birth in Ventura and then raised with my adopted parents up in the Walnut Creek Bay Area, which is on the Oakland side of the Bay, and became a Giants and 49er fan back then because my dad was listening to those games on the radio and stuff. And turned out my dad had a hard time, Chuck had a hard time making money. He was bouncing checks and stuff. That caused a lot of stress with the family. So, um, mm -hmm. One day we just drove off without him down to Lake Havasu. And I was really unhappy. Uh, I remember, I like, remember you no, told me that. There's no family discussion. There's no, let's have a meeting on this. Like, it was just like, we just drove off without him. My sister was in the front seat. She was adopted also. She knew about it. And so she, my mom knew about it. So it really put up a wall against them for me. Cause I really felt I was really tight with my dad. He was like the fun dad and could go out and play catch with you and joke around all that stuff. He just didn't have a, any talent in making money. And uh, that's kind of a critical thing when you're raising a family, but they, uh, but it gave me a lesson that kind of messed up way that money equates love, basically. Like if you don't have your, your money in order, good luck getting love. And um, so that put me on the road to basically putting my career first. I was always, always knew I was kind of on my own. I was going to take care of myself from a really early age. And um, I didn't trust my, my sister or my mom that much because it just, you know, I felt betrayed and, yeah. um, and basically used the, the, throughout junior high and high school, I kind of used the, the, the family uh, experience was really more like a place to eat, sleep, shower, do homework, watch TV, all, pretty much in my room. It wasn't like, I, they would never go, I would play, I luckily, it was kind of jumping around a lot. Luckily, in seventh grade, I made the uh, tryouts for the interscholastic basketball team. And the, having that structure, having a practice every day, traveling to different cities, it, you know, we'd take bus rides, we had to wear a tie every time on game days. And being part of that group that I, from seventh grade through my senior year in high school, basically the same guys playing all three sports was so so uh helped my development so much because it taught you how how hard you have to work to achieve things and how hard you have to push yourself past side aches and you know especially like playing football and doing two a days in august in arizona where it was like 120 degrees and humid in the august because it's monsoon season exactly. we do two day practices and 
and it was brutal, but you got you got so tough because of that. And then it kind of made you realize you can, having that kind of background made me realize as an artist, I can kind of compete against anybody. I'll just work harder, I'll put more hours in or whatever, because it's all you can do is, one of the key things, one of my, my civics teachers taught me when I was a senior was, people that succeed are doing things that other people don't want to do. You got to keep you know doing things. And you have to basically, and then Mike Tyson quote too, you have to, learn how to love the things that other people hate as far as how hard you have to push yourself. You have to love that, the grind of it and everything. And um, that uh, basically cutting back to the art career, going back through from freshman year in high school, I started drawing really detailed, um, actually I've got, I could, I've got a few I could uh, run up but from high school, pencil drawings that, uh, I don't think we can pause for a second. I can run down. All right. Do you have it? You have it downstairs or something? Right, they're downstairs. Yeah, I could. Uh, I think grab grab it in a sec. I just want to keep going. Like, well, okay. yeah, we can do that later, maybe at the end. Um, so yeah, I started getting. Uh, I was just all self-taught. I just I just would sit down with a like a photo a cover of Sports Illustrated. Start with the pupil, the dark shape of the pupil, and like where the highlight is next to that, and look how the the shapes are next to that, and slowly, <laughs> long as all of those are working, I just go out and just build out until the whole thing was done. So I didn't, then I had to, then, that was through high school. And then I, like at my big commission, I got for $50. So this is back in 70s, 1976. And that was probably like, I don't know, 500 bucks now for a high school guy to do a cover of Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, but twice up. So I had to figure out in my head how to do that with colored pencils and everything. And, and I'd love to see it now, how that thing turned out. Yeah, like, I'd love it too. But, but um, so, but basically I was like, I thought I was an artist because I could just copy something, but that's not really an artist. That's a, just a copier. And uh, so I learned some skills and then I, because the high school didn't really have an arts program, um, but they had I took advanced art when I was a, when I was a senior, my first art class I took, and they basically just said, do whatever you want. So I just kept doing exactly what I was doing. I didn't learn a thing, but I went to a junior college class um, my senior year in, uh, commercial art illustration and design. And this was in Havasu? And, yeah, in Havasu at the, okay, okay. at the JC in Lake Havasu. And the the uh, teacher came home after this one watercolor of this this goblet with green water in it and a, and a watercolor illustration. And it turned out really good. And I hadn't really worked in watercolors before. And then the teacher came home to the, my house and talked to my parents and said they, a stepdad then, uh, by that time named Rocky, um he was rough um he, the uh teacher said don't let him go to art school get him right in the field as soon as you can that's your art school will just kind of teach him a bunch of theory and stuff but he's got to get into the field and learn what it's really like and all that stuff which Interesting. um made it to where the, my parents were kind of relieved because they have to worry about because i want to go to art center that was like a at the time like forty thousand a year private art school and everything and and uh they were kind of relieved they didn't have to worry about that world. I just they just moved me to um uh we moved to Whittier the day after my high school graduation, which was you know going from you know as, as tons of friends, you know, all just through I was the type of guy in high school. I was the because I got my butt kicked when I was uh, uh in junior high, I was a big fan of this comedian named Don Rickles, he's kind of an insult comic, and I would I had a friend, my friend who was a, he was a big, he was like a 6'2", big athlete guy. And I was, you know, re kind of regular size for that age. And I was, I got real cocky and I just, we were told to, we were asked to, to run laps in PE. And this one guy, Mike Brennan, didn't want to run laps. And I, I was like, going, come on, Brennan, run. So he goes, he goes, oh, fuck you, Lynch. And, yeah. so then, but then uh, he goes, let's fight after school. I go, no, I don't want to fight. He goes, yeah. And then my big buddy goes, yeah, you can kick his ass. Fight him. I'm like, oh, then all day. Because that was the morning, that was my morning class. And all day, the whole school heard about this fight after school that was going to happen. I was like, oh, God. I didn't know what, you know, I go, well, I'm, I'm more athletic. I can beat him, whatever. And then get out there across the street from the junior high, but in the parking lot of this paint store. It was like I was just surrounded by the whole school and uh, get out there and I just got my ass kicked and I, he was angry at me for just being such a dick and um, I didn't I didn't have any passion to fight I, I thought I could just you know kind of box and weave and stuff I just kind of first just god god I just got pummeled I remember walking to school the next day and just in such shame and the 
bus passing by, like I, it just so humiliated that it made me in that moment be much nicer person and not be a dick to people and just try to be as nice as possible. And then, so in the in the high school era, I got you know, they, we had like the group called the Jocks, so we had the heads. The heads were people that smoked, you know, in the gulch, gulch. Yeah, you got all your groups, yeah. And all the, those guys and the Jocks were the, the athletes and all that stuff. But I was. Me and a couple other friends were like in between. We were in both worlds. We'd go to the high school parties and stuff, but also play sports. So you kind of try to have friends with everybody, which was nice. And um, that uh, that's up to that's up to basically all the way through high school. Very fun. Very just love the whole social life and everything. And then um, the day after graduation, just hopped in uh, my car. I was a used '68 uh, Cadillac that, that my stepdad let me have. And they drove off in their Ford truck. We drove to Whittier and just started from scratch, not knowing anybody, pre-internet, pre-cell phone, just going to Whittier, which is, you know, you, I think I've driven you by there before. I've been to Whittier for like baseball tournaments, remember? We yeah, so yeah much way out there. And, and, out uh, yeah, just, and they got a job at a, a little free giveaway newspaper. I, I, I had a little portfolio of drawings. I went around and showed it. I got a, a job at a great little place because it was like this a dumpy little newspaper, but they had a full out art department with probably eight different artists, all ranging from guys in their 60s to guys in their early 20s. And it was just really a great place to, to learn and, and make friends and everything. It was- um, How old were you at the time? I was uh, like 19. Okay. 19 and then uh, that I was there for a couple a um, year and a half or so that I got one of the guys who was like the head illustrator artist of that of the of the, that team um, was doing freelance work for this one company. Then he came to me and said, "Hey, they're looking for an artist. You want to try that?" So I went and showed my stuff. They got hired, and it was I was went from like a nice social circumstance to a um, and all the while I was working at the first place, I was taking night classes and, and yeah. life drawing all this stuff and learning as much as I could on the weekends and at night because I wasn't going to college. Other than night school, and, yeah, and, uh, and how was, I didn't know anybody career. anyway. I didn't know I was like this fit into my credo of like get my career going first. Don't worry about yeah. relationships, none of that stuff because you only have so many hours in a day. And so I, I was as happy I was in the field I wanted to be in. I wanted ever since watching Bewitched back in, uh, you know, as a kid, I loved the idea of like you can make a living drawing and something drawing even as coffee cans and coffee cups. Like at least you're doing something artistic that is you know that you, you make a living at. Yeah. So um, let's see. So that I mean, that's, that's that first section. But, and how uh, long I, were you at the, the newspaper for? Like, how long was, I was that there for? A little over two years. Okay. Oh, so it was a decent amount of time. That was yeah. a lot. Okay. See, yeah, it might have been a year and a half too. It was, it was right around there, but I thought it got really settled and comfortable. Yeah. And the whole group of people that I was friendly with, and then um, I was able to. My uh, did my first published illustrations and stuff for for that little cartoons and things, which was fun. And but then I got a southern job, which was working for this Mormon company that did they did like little calendars and T-shirts and iron things. They had a big factory where they did silk screening. Um, and I, I was hired as the the artist, the only artist in the whole bunch. I had my own little office to myself. And that was it. And they had people working with silk screens, the guys who made the silk screens and ran the dark room. And slowly but surely, they started firing everybody because business wasn't so great. So I had to learn how to do the silk screens, how to make silk screens, how to run the dark room. And I was like a one-man show, which is great because I could print my own T-shirts. So we, we, me and my friend John, who came out from after he graduated college, we, like there was a Mike Tyson fight that we did T-shirts for that. We sold outside and there was a, we did protest shirts against uh, Reaganomics because Reagan was speaking. We sold all those out. So like fun having access to all that, but it was kind of lonely because it was literally just me and, um, you know, just this, the, the bosses of the place, but it, was, it wasn't collaborative or anything, or anything. So I would just yeah. draw all day, listen to talk radio and just, you know, then go to night classes and stuff like that. But it was a job, you know, it was, it was definitely got me going. That seems to, tough though. That seems tough. Yeah, but it was, you know, I was happy because I was in my field. I was, I was exactly. you know, going True. in the right direction, you know. Yeah. And then that led to, let's see, they shut down. So I got laid off there. So then I was able to wow. collect unemployment for a summer. And I was even thinking about maybe joining the Air Force or something because the economy was really bad. I thought, well, man, I could do posters. 
for the Air Force or something like that. It'd be cool. How old were you then? I was tw- just 20, about 21, 22. Okay. In that range, 20, 20, yeah, about 22. And um, the, uh, during that summer, I, I, we, we luckily I didn't have to pay any rent because my friend's brother, who was my, my friend was John Bean, his brother was mm-hmm. Michael Bean, and he was in the first Terminator movie, then he's in the Abyss, and he was, he luckily had a film. We, luckily for us, he got hired to do a film in England for the summer. So he needed a house sitter. So me and John were able to stay at his house in Van Nuys for the summer. We kind of destroyed the place. We didn't. <laughs> we we took a piece of plywood and nailed it to his garage roof and put a basketball hoop up so he could play basketball. So it, was, it just looked horrible. We did. We just thought that was cool. They don't care. And we we're supposed to take care of the cat, and we didn't. The, the cat died after we left because. We kept oh. giving it. We kept giving it cans of cat food. We just opened up the can and set it down. Then we would just leave, and we didn't realize he had one of those kind of Persian faces. It's kind of concave a little bit, and so oh. he couldn't really eat the food because his forehead and chin oh. would hit it, and he couldn't oh, get into the. No. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, but we didn't know it. But then he he he, he got cancer, and I don't think that was our fault. But they, they weren't real happy with our house sitting skills. Yeah. Um, we had fun though. Other than the, the, the damage we did and the, the cat uh, uh, pro- deceased problem, but it was a great summer. And then after that, <laughs> I went to uh, LA Trade Tech for because they had a commercial art program, which was great because I already had a lot of skills coming into it. And it was a program that was run from uh, seven eight. You had to be there at seven. It was downtown LA. I lived in Whittier. No, actually, I lived in Glendale at the time. I moved from Whittier to Glendale. I got an apartment there. And um, the uh, yeah, they're really, really strict. That You had to be there at 7. It was 7 to noon, five days a week. And if you weren't there at 7, they'd lock the doors. They, they treat like a real job, like uh, discipline. Like, so, I remember uh, this, yeah. Yeah, that was great. And from that, I did a semester there. Then I, I won Best Portfolio uh contests that they have every year just from one semester and then I got a job from that which was this company called Huerta Design and they did things like the Tyson um, Tyco Tyson race cars as a, like slot cars we do the packaging for that and I would do like draw marker drawings of those designs and different logo designs but they're very corporate and very clean I was like really happy and then I was there for about three months and they got another offer from a complete opposite place, a place called Pacific Ioneer, which did album covers um, and uh, all kinds of just, you know, more rock and roll kind of things. And it was like the, the very first interview with her in a Saturday, my portfolio. And then there was like a little, it was a fourplex and the owner of the company owned the fourplex. He lived in one of them. This art studio was in one of them and they rented out the other two. But he's one of those guys that like it was a 9, 9 a.m. on a Saturday and, He's already getting high and he opens a little trap door and he's got his beard and he, you know, the door, <laughs> the peak door, and he goes, okay, come on in. And, and he goes, well, I get high. I go, no, 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 I'm good. <laughs> and uh, end up getting hired. And he, he produced some of the most famous uh, album covers over the years. And also Drew Struzan, those guys were placed and he went on to become one of the most famous movie illustrators. If you just Google Drew Struzan, this works amazing. You've seen it all over the place, all the Star Wars stuff. And uh, tons of um, tons of tons of work all over the place, but so I ended up working for him for three years until they went out of business. But during that time, it was it was really it was like me, him, his wife was the secretary and accountant, and another guy who was a salesperson, and that was it for that company. Wow. That's where I learned how to be from going from an illustrator to be an art director, and uh, it was a whole different environment because he was the type. As of some of these, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all those, that's, that's Drew right there. But these are like, just some of his work. Yeah, he's, he's done that Back to the Future, um, all these things. Cool. He, he was, he's really, really great illustrator. We work with him. I'm friends with his, uh, uh, his son I'm in partnership with in this one company called Me. Um, and um, what else? Um, so that was a different kind of environment because he was like, he was the type of guy that, literally got high morning, noon, and night. He was, that was just how he functioned. Mm. And, and, and sometimes he had a problem with something. I'd say, maybe maybe you're just, maybe you're a little too high, or maybe you shouldn't smoke so much. Go, no, no, I'm not high enough. That's the problem. And that was his attack towards everything. 
And uh, but he's still kicking. He's like in his seventies now, and he's he's uh, he's still working and producing. We're still. I call him every every year on his birthday. Oh, before. really? Nice. Yeah, Ernie, yeah. Remember we went to his house one time, and uh, he, he. Do you remember when he was driving out in the desert, and he had that electric scooter? He was driving around the the, the pool, and he fell in the pool, and the car freaked out because. How old was I? I must have been small. You like, were I probably even... three, maybe. Three? Two, three. You don't remember that? <laughs> well, I don't know. Something stand out. Some memories. No, I know, I know. Oh, that sounds funny though. But yeah, anyway, so cut to let's get to the career stuff. Uh, that job ended, so then I got. Um, I was doing interviews, and I wanted to get into entertainment. I got referred by a couple people that uh, said you should get into go to this company. I went to this company called Signer. They like my book, but having enough entertainment uh, uh, pieces. So then I got, I got a job at a company in Century City. And so as at the time, now this is how I still live anywhere, because I was commuting in my car McGee from Whittier to, to Century City every day wow. to a place called Prism Entertainment, where I we did, video, did video boxes. And I was there for about six months. And I finally got I called back to Seidegger. And they, they, they gave me a shot to do thumbnails over the weekend for free to read a script and do thumbnails for Robbie Dangerfield's first movie, Back to School. And I ended up getting that and then I ended up getting hired. And then I got my first poster, which is really tough. Cause one of the, one of the senior art directors, when I first started there, brought me in under his wing. He said, you know, don't be disappointed if, you know, it takes over a year or two before you get your first poster. It's really competitive and da da da. I ended up getting my first one. My second, I like, it's got like five in a row. It was like, it, it was like, seemed so easy. And so then I got got a reputation for being like the hotshot kid. And I was only at this place, it was crazy. This 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 boss, going from a guy who was a stoner to this boss was kind of a cokehead. And he would wow. he and he had to work there as late as possible. He couldn't buy around midnight and check on your work. And he'd come by, oh, he was all jacked up. Oh, I love it. This is great. This is great. This is great. It was like a Friday night. And, oh great, you go home, you really then come in tomorrow morning and do some more. And so Saturday morning roll in. Look at the same exact work. Oh, this stuff sucks. This is horrible. Because this is exactly what you just saw the night before. But it was just, it was this different you know, person. Kind of chemically imbalanced a bit. But that was in the 80s. And that whole era was like just, you know, just high octane. Coke was everywhere. If you want, if you, if, if, if you would use it for work, because oh, I got to work till midnight anyway. I work till two. And uh, really unhealthy environments as far as that whole world, as far as it, establishing bad habits and stuff. But there, it was kind of an era where oh, it was it was more socially acceptable. And thought of like this is this how you know, people do things. This is how you know industry, how the entertainment industry in particular really operates. So are drugs or were drugs seen as like a tool to be more creative at the time? Yeah, de definitely. Especially coming from the rock, looking at art as kind of rock and roll in a sense, where you, you didn't want to fall, you didn't want to just be. A cookie cutter mentality like an accountant or something like that if you're an artist you're kind of you related to rock and roll artists and stuff and you wanted to push the boundaries and break the rules and just expand your consciousness and you know most of my rock and roll heroes all did that same kind of thing like the beatles and, and uh guys like that to where it just seemed like part of if you're in a creative field you want to try to push use any excuse you can to push your boundaries and push your consciousness into mm -hmm. ideas that you may not think of normally, which then can become a crutch, obviously, because if you can't, if you lean on that to create, then, you know, but when you're young, you don't realize, you don't, you hear the stories of disaster, number, but everybody when they're young thinks they're immortal and nothing's going to affect them and you bounce back real quickly. But then, you know, you, you see people to the left and right of you kind of, you know, falling off the right, falling into trouble. And, Plenty of warning signs, but you always think, oh, I'm fine. I don't, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm good. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it was a tougher thing to get a hold of because so much of it for the first part of my life was just seen as hey, whatever you've got. If you've got these kind of drugs, do them. It's fun, whatever. It's like, and you can do it for work. It's like, it's never, it wasn't a, even had clients would say, hey, whatever got drugs you guys got, do them. I need you guys to, to kill yourself on this. We need solutions. So it's like, it was, wow. it was a different kind of environment to where it wasn't like it. Now it's very, it's very taboo and very, uh, you know, socially unacceptable and professionally even more so. You can't, you just can't do that. But there was a time where it was just, it was just kind of, 
you know, thought of as, as, as part of the part of doing business basically, you know? Yeah. Like some like mad, like it's like different, but like someone like mad men kind of a little. Yeah, with like alcohol is the same kind of thing. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. It's, it's like whatever, it's but it's how it normalized. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. part of the, the, the fabric of it to a certain extent. Yeah. It's in certain circles. I can't say that for every company, but yeah, companies, it was very, uh, it was very just like every company is its own different society, different. Yeah. Companies. It was just like ingrained. It was ingrained in like that type of job, basically pretty yeah. much or like in a lot of just places especially at the time that's what it seems like yeah yeah especially the, especially the 80s um and then going into that i so i got hired away from signer after a year there which is great to survive that i had a winter season and a summer season then a company that came out from new york called spiros they were looking for art directors so the people at paramount who i knew recommended me and i kind of jumped there and um that uh that was great because it wasn't ran by this one big tyrant. It was ran by this Greek investor guy. And he didn't, he wasn't an artist, but he just let the artists kind of run the whole show. And we, I was, there was like seven other art directors and we would all, but it was all very competitive. We'd go and bring our ideas into this boardroom. And the, and it was almost like a, it was an insult. It was like a cut fest almost as far as, you know, you would, you would tear other people's work down to admit, and it was just weird. It was kind of fun, mm. funny, but it was a tough room. And you'd really go in there and, and hopefully, hopefully you'd have stuff that the boss would like. And it was just totally subjective though. That's the thing about art. You can't, you can't prove with any equation that this is exactly. a piece of yours. And just, you know, it, it's one of the weird things about it because you can, you can do stuff for, you know, you can do two weeks worth of work and it's your very, very last one that accidentally is the best one after doing all that work. I'm so, I'm so curious a little like, when you did show it to the boss and stuff, did you like, did you try to sell it at all? Like, were you talking, like trying to say anything or you just like yeah, unveil I it? I, mean, I, kind of like, I was always kind of the work is, is either the, the image hits you or not. You can't talk somebody into life. That's what I'm saying. It's like, is it literally like you just like unveil it and then you just like stand there and then they look at no, it? Well, like, we, I'd have a stack. We'd have a stack of, of like ideas that I got oh. this one, I got this one, I got this one. And um, Back then it was pre-computer. We had that's where having having illustration background really helped. And you know, we had an airbrush and we got to fully illustrate with that was even before they had color copiers. We we basically get a contact sheet, which was from the movie. Every scene they have a photographer on set is taking pictures of every single angle that's going on in that scene. And there's another scene that's you and you just go through thousands of these with a loop, thousands of these of these contact sheets and circle the ones you want. Then you had your stack of photos that you'd work with and design with, and people would get really um, possessive about if you got a better shot of Tom Cruise and the other guy, you want to kind of keep that because that's, you know, if you find, if you get the best shot, that's you know that could be a poster in itself, just a type on it almost, and you know you're 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 halfway home. But yeah, um, like a lot, but one of the first ones I did for that company was the poster for La Bamba, and. It was basically just a cool shot of him with this guitar strap leaning against this wall, and it just I just cropped it and put a little logo on it that I did, and they just went with it. It's because like, it had a it had a, an attitude, it had a just a certain energy. It wasn't like a collage of all these different scenes. It was just singular and just you know had you know just had a cool point of view to it. Just you just could relate to the guy's attitude. Um, and anyway, so we worked at that company for. Hmm, about two years and then it got sold to another group and then we renamed them Dazu. And by that time I hired, I was like the head training director and I hired Don, who was at Signinger, Don Bailey. And then she brought in Clyde, who was her boyfriend. He was our director at Signinger. And then after a year or two at Dazu, we were all getting hired away by different companies or at least giving offers to get hired away. And then the, one day we all had plans to leave. And then Don came in one Monday and said, well, I'm my cousin said, if we're in such demand, we just start our own thing. Go, oh, that's, that, that's a good idea. So we secretly planned to do that. And we, then we had to talk, try to find a backer to cover our salaries and get equipment, all that stuff. And that took about, we had to do eight different interviews to get that. And we finally got it. But before that, we had, we got the, our owner found out about it, that we were looking around and we decided, me and Don Clive said, well, let's just tell them the truth. This is America. We're trying to chase the American dream. And all that stuff. And so when we go in there and we're ready to tell the truth, 
and he and he asked us, so are you guys out looking at you guys starting a second thing? And, and Clive said, absolutely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I still, that still cracks me up because he's like, he's like so, he has such a good integrity and he's such a great guy. But the, that one thing was like, just kind of put his mind in the eight ball because then we had to end up lying to him that we were doing that. And we're just saying, yeah, we're doing it. Which is like, or he could have made us a counter offer. Well, if you stay, I'll give you this and this and this, you know? And, and so that was, that was a real, you know, that was a yeah. funny moment. Then when we finally did get started, we got, we, it was me, Don, Clive, and Bailey, Don, Clive Bailey, Rick Wrench, Don Taliban. It was alphabetical. It was um, the names were by age, alphabetical, and obviously the sandwich, which is great because if you get free advertising on every menu for the most part, we're gonna, you know, it's like at least it's a known thing. And uh, we went into partnership with a company that did trailers called Kaleidoscope. They were looking to start a print division. And um, we, were there for about five years in their building before that we we did a job for Mike Ovitz, who was a big um, he was a big talent agent at the time. He was a huge, huge in the industry. And instead of getting payment, we just wanted some business advice from him. And he said, buy all your stock back, own all your company, and do that. So we, he set up something with a lawyer, then we went to the company, the guys that bought us, that put us in business originally and bought them out. And then he became independent and then they moved to the CNN building. In at Sunset and Cahuenga, uh had the whole eighth floor at the time, which we barely used half of it at the time. We had extra rooms for yoga and a gym and all this stuff. And then by we were well, pre-pandemic, we had three, three and a half floors and about 200, 220 or so employees. And now post-pandemic, we were, we're down to about 145 people. And we don't need we've been working from home since this time almost exactly a year ago today and um it's been a whole you know survival because it's just we've been doing great up until this year but this year has been a pure just break even um just just survive the year until yeah. it's back to normal and it's, it sucks though for you know guys who had to let go and lay off and stuff it's, it's nothing of, none of their fault at all it's just trying to help to have the business survive and you know it takes it takes tough decisions to, to decide who's essential, who's not essential, and you know how that can hurt somebody's feelings. And you know, like Howie and Dobby, my guys, they both got let go early because Howie, personal assistant, you know, is nice to have, but it's not a necessity. And Dobby, they just never really liked that much anyway. So I couldn't, you know, fight. And there, everybody lost people off their team. So you know, that's just yeah. that's the life of COVID. Show you this. This is exactly <laughs> 22 years ago. Both of us 22 Maybe. years ago. It's <laughs> what? Both of us 22 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Jesus. Jeez. Same hairline. <laughs> I know. Hey, stay consistent though. Yeah. 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 Let's make it in. <laughs> so, um, what else? Yeah. Kind of burnt out talking about work stuff, but um, um, it's yeah, I mean, we can still talk too if you want to ask about stuff, or we can, you know, we don't have to go all through everything right now, too. No, that's like, good. Yeah, to... let's, take a, let's take a break from that. You guys, you know, you guys talk for a bit or ask some other questions. <laughs> um, I do have a question. Um, early on, you talked about how you left, um, I think it was a Bay Area or like Oakland, yeah, Walnut Creek. Yeah, so you said we left. Um, who does we entail? I was my, I had an older sister, Pat, who was adopted also, and my adopted mom, Norma. Okay. And, and Kat, we had a cat, Gussie. I was the, we, it was a green Volkswagen bug. I was in the back seat with the cat in the cage, Gussie, and my sister was in the front seat, and my mom was driving. Yeah. How did you? I'm just driving away without, without your dad. I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah, that's crazy. I was screaming in my head. I didn't talk did for like through... two, three days after that. I didn't talk to anybody. I was like just totally, totally shut down. Okay. Did you guys come to this decision just like all of a sudden, or was this like well, a gradual conversation? Just, at the time, Lake Havasu was trying to, they're trying to sell land. They were a master plan community by this guy who ran this oil company called McCulloch Oil. And 
it was a it was on the Colorado River between Arizona and California, and there was a lake there, Lake Abzu, that was caught, that was formed by this Parker Dam that they put in. And this oil guy would test his. He also had an outboard motor, a boat, uh, a motorboat company that they would test the motors on this lake. And he liked the place so much. He goes, I could. We should make this a city. So they kind of built it as the first master plan community where everything was designed from scratch. And here's what the schools would be. And here's how the streets would work and all that. And then they they would fly people in to, like in the winter, they'd fly people in from Minnesota and Wisconsin and all over the country to a free flight in, weekend on them, stay in their hotel, and they'll show you, they'll try to sell you land to get people mm-hmm. to come there. And in the, in the summer, it's beautiful. It's like in the 70s and Yes, it's just gorgeous. And the lake is beautiful, and the mountains are beautiful. And but in summer, it's like and the it's super hot. It's like 120, 100, you know, between 110 and 120 all the time. And you know, that's just part of the desert, desert living. But so anyway, so my folks went, they brought back a brochure. Yeah, we bought a lot. We're gonna build a house. And you know, I had to leave my friends and everything, but it's gonna be okay. It's like a new start and everything. And then you um you know, so but this as a, as a whole family, we're all going to move down. There was a discussion until the day we left, and just it was just without my dad. I was like, that was just that was rough. That was it, though. Like you never got more out of Norma. Like, like you didn't find out more of a reason, or like just because you didn't make money. Like it was that just like day it of. Was, like- it was just it was it was something that it was just old school. Like you know, we made it. There was not one discussion about it. There was even after that, I was just so mad, and she was like. I'm sorry, yeah, you know, you know, this is what I had to do, whatever. But it was never, it was a different era. It just wasn't yeah. discussed. It was like, you know, back when, you know, if you got in trouble, you know, you get spanked, you'd bring out a hairbrush and, you know, pull your pants down and get spanked. It was like this a whole different society, basically, you know? Yeah. There's no seatbelts, metal dashboards, smoking in the car and smoking while pumping gas. I mean, it was like just a whole different, you know. Yeah society in the 60s and early 70s how did you feel leaving your dad um because i imagine that would be hard like you you don't know until you have that conversation with um your adopted mother and um just to leave your dad like that 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 must be tough yeah it was it was um it was tough and and he would come down and visit sometimes and um I think he actually spent a little time in jail, maybe I think for bouncing checks. He got into financial problem. He just couldn't cover himself. And I always felt bad for him because he was a good guy. But he just didn't have, I think, just the, the IQ to really know how to 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 produce. Um, and this was after he already came back from the war, too, right? He was already yeah, he like in the war. Yeah, he served in World War II. Yeah. Um, and, you know, on the surface, I, everything would look perfect as far as I guess the two young kids, you know, a little nuclear family going. And, um, but on the flip side, he just, he just couldn't get, you know, he couldn't make enough income or keep a job together to, to pay the bills. So maybe you feel sorry for him even more so like, you know. Yeah, his whole family. Somebody's trying his best, but he's just, you know, either can't find the right career or whatever. But um, yeah. yeah, so he, so I'd go visit him on weekends. Sometimes we'd go and, and sometimes we got flown up to Walnut Creek and hang with him or he'd drive down. We'd visit and so I'd go to San Diego or something. And uh, uh, then eventually as he got older, we got a house, we moved him in because he he really, you know, couldn't really kick him, couldn't afford to take care of himself so much. So we had an extra room. And when we had Zach and Chloe, me and Carmen and Zach and Chloe, we, he lived downstairs for a while till we sold the house and moved to the Palisades. And then we got him a little little uh, prefab house down where the trailer parks were the PCH, which was really nice for him. And then- hey, Chris probably knows that. Chris, you know, like on PCH, when you pass to mess school, it's like a little trailer park we can turn into. It's like right there. Maybe you don't, but like he lives right there. It's like right near- You can actually see it from that little park outside the house here, that little lot. You yeah. can see his blue, his blue and white little house. Okay. Yeah, so it's like super close, like right there. Yeah. Yeah. But then that to we had to when me and Carmen divorced, we got two separate houses and I to afford getting both houses, we just sell his place. Then he moved in with me. 
and lived with me for about three years or so before that he couldn't really take care of. He started falling down and getting, um, uh, he just couldn't, couldn't, he was just losing his, his faculties basically. So we put him into an assisted living place in Palisades and he was there until he died. So, but it was good to be able to spend some time with him near the end, but missed, maybe we missed time before that. And during that process, um, when the, when um, the kids were, was Zach and Chloe were probably around two, two and a half or three, Carmen hired a prior detective to find my adopted parents. So we found, wow. we found my mom, Kelly, who lives up in Santa Cruz. And then we found Bobby, my dad, who, uh, you know, he's kind of just like, I mean, he's the first time I met somebody who was like me. He was smart. He was, he, he was successful. He um, was kind of crazy in certain aspects also. And uh, I actually go down to visit him this weekend. He's like, he's like a, he used to be the, the number one drug defense attorney in Beverly Hills. And so he's got all kinds of crazy stories that the people he's defended and the world that he occupied during the, during the eighties. At the same time I was partying super hard in the eighties, I could have got arrested and accidentally had hired him as my defense lawyer and realized it's my dad. I mean, wow. <laughs> I could have actually yeah. in some universe that has happened, some multiverse. Yeah, he just called. I talked to him earlier. He called me for the birthday. Oh, it's nice. so funny. Like, we were on for like, I don't know, 20 minutes, but like, you know, it goes into stories. Like, it was just, oh, you're it was lucky. Great. You it was great. Minutes. Yeah. He's so hard to get off the conversation, man. It's, oh, yeah. He got, he was, just, it was just one story for like 10 minutes where it, barely, it was just funny. Like, it was just, you know, how he tells it. And like, the punchline was like, literally nothing. Like, there was no pun. <laughs> And he'll like, crack himself up. No, he was just dying. Story. I was, I had to start getting ready because I had class. I was like doing my little stuff, like trying to get ready. And like he was just, it was just funny. And then we just talked a bit more after. But like you can totally get 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 in, into it, like very into his stories. It's so yeah. good. Yeah, some crews now because he got vaccinated. I got a second dose. It was that story. Right? It was about him getting back. Oh. oh yeah, he told about his his dick in line, and then he left the line, and then <laughs> it was like went on. It was so funny. <laughs> yeah it was good though but yeah keep going yeah mom got the private detectives found bobby met him he's first person yeah they're similar yeah yeah, yeah so we went, met kelly first and that was that was interesting it's weird and that is really kind of sad in a way meeting your mom who we never actually met before and you know what she went through as far as they hooked up in college when uh they went to he went to stanford, went to stanford and she was going to some local smaller college and just one of those things and she ended up getting pregnant and in that era you know you couldn't it was very anti-social anti very frowned upon to be pregnant and just cruising around you know like a normal person so they uh decided to do have they shipped her down to bobby's parents ranch they had a ranch down in ojai and she did the term of her pregnancy there and then i was born in ventura and Bobby said he always thought his parents would end up keeping the baby and help raise it and all that, so keeping me. But they now they just let it let it go. And so then Kelly said she would. That's my mom, Kelly. She had a she's a pretty big depression after that. Just the idea of you know carrying a baby, getting attached with that long, you're just giving birth yeah. and that would just they taken away. And you know, they say there's some developmental issues that come from when you're adopted, and we never have that chance to bond and really connect. Certain certain synapses in your brain don't connect the same way when you have that you know that coddling acceptance versus being just you know just taken away like that yeah. so you know but you don't know when it's yourself what what your version of loving somebody feels like compared to what other versions feel like because you're just like in your own fishbowl you're just, you know have your own your own version of your emotions or whatever you've got yeah yeah, exactly. No one can. Like everyone has their own emotions for everything. We can just relate to saying, "Oh, that's what this is," but we never actually know, right? And you don't know what you're feeling compared to what the other person's feeling. Yeah, that's the same yeah. thing. Like, even like I say this sometimes, like, "Oh, that that color is green," and like we both agree that's green, but like actually, who knows if something's different in the way your lenses or the like wavelengths that like go into your head and the way you interpret that color where it actually looks exactly. look it could be completely different because we can't we can't describe it anymore oh that's green and you're like okay oh, exactly. that's, it's like it's almost like that like your feelings we can agree oh you feel like that oh i call it this and then it's like okay but like it's completely just based on you like no one can actually 
fool, you know, unless we invent something where you can, I don't know, in the future, you actually feel what other people feel, but yeah, yeah you can't. Oh, man. Yeah, but then, yeah. Oh, then, then, so Kelly was a little more, Kelly was so, she's such a nice person. She's never, I've never heard her say, you know, mean thing about anybody. Where, where Bobby is more of a temper, he, you know, he's got big fists. He used to represent boxers and stuff. And he's had a crazy checkerboard life. But when I first met him, which was a few days, a few a month or so after we met Kelly, it just, the detective was great. He was able to cut right through and find, you know, find these guys right off the bat. He was going to, we went, we, we agreed to meet at Masuhisha, the sushi place in Beverly Hills. And his original idea was, but he didn't know if I had a sense of humor or not, but he was going to, he's going to hire a midget, a, a little black, he's a little African-American midget and put him in a white suit and chain. And, and when he saw me come running up, he goes, son, son, just to, to see what I would do. But he chickened out the last second. He thought it'd be, you know, he thought maybe it might be freaked out or something like that. But we ended up meeting and getting to know each other for about like three hours or so over dinner. And, um, uh, Became really close friends. We were able to. He had a group of guys they'd go to, like the World Series games or Super Bowls and stuff. So I went to a couple all, all baseball all star games. So I brought Zach to one of them. We went to Pittsburgh. Oh, that's when we went to Pittsburgh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it's a, this really fun group of guys, and uh, it was it was interesting to to meet somebody you could really relate to. You kind of, at least I could see myself in it. We even looked similar, except he's a little shorter. Uh, but the the um, starting relationship where you skip the parenting part and start as like just adults, but you still your dad. It's kind of weird. There's, you know, there's nothing I can really compare it to other than just meeting a new friend that you're actually, you know, your 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 blood related to. When when being adopted, you you just feel you you know you have your parents, but you really don't, you know. After a while, you go, well, that's not me, that's not me. And I'm, okay, but you're they're taking care of me, so that's great. And they, you know, you know, give me a line, which is awesome, but you don't have that much of a family connection, especially when Norma remarried into Rocky, you know, it was a super Italian family. I go to holidays and Christmas and everything with them. And boy, I didn't relate to anybody. I felt like I was such an outcast. I just didn't, you know, didn't feel it just didn't feel like part of the tribe. It was just going there because I had to go there and just hang yeah. out, you know, that kind of thing. Did you relate to your, your adopted sister at all? We always had a little bit of a schism. We, we did when we were younger, but once like she was on the other side, she was on mom, team mom and I was on team dad kind of. Mm. So we, they, they had that going on. So I always had a little bit of a grudge, I think, against them. And, uh, We've never, we, I don't know if it's part of being adopted or not. We've never really been that close. You know, we're in touch on our birthdays and stuff, and, and we're polite with each other. We don't not like each other, but there's never really been that much of a connection. I, I may go back all the way to that, that first time we took off, where it was like she was in on it and I wasn't. So I put this wall up, like, okay, uh, you, guys, yeah. you guys, I'll be on my side over here. Yeah, it's like terrible. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I just say that's terrible. Like that's just. Yeah, it's, I I know now because it's been a while, but still, like, they weren't thinking about you though. Like, they were just how much older? I, I don't even like. When was the last time we even like seen her too? Or like, have I? She was she was over here about seven or eight years ago. She came and hung out for a while, and uh, now she's in Albuquerque. I think she's she's nursing. You know, working working in a hospital in Albuquerque. Okay. Uh, so, you know, we talked about some COVID stuff and everything, but we're just not really, we never got that close, right? You know, I have regrets about that, but I don't know what you're going to really do about it now other than try to be more in touch. But that's one thing. The older you get, there's more people you got to keep, kind of keep in touch with. And mm -hmm. we take all day, every day, just, just keep in touch with people where I think, well, the phone works both ways. You can always call me and, you know, reach out that way too versus... Yeah, and then everyone else is busy. Like everyone, everyone's busy, right? Everyone's yeah, doing their stuff, cool. has their people, so it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, Chris, what were you trying to say though? I kind of cut you off. Um, I was gonna ask about 
um, when you met your, your biological parents, what kind of headspace were you in? Were you angry at them? Were you? No, not at all. I was really curious. I was just hoping because I was, I came from kind of lower middle class kind of upbringing. I was just, and I was starting to be successful. I was just not looking forward to thinking like these people might want a hand out. They might need, you know, mm. be taken care of it because I didn't want to have more people like that on my, on my, uh, on my, on my, sleeve basically but they're both totally self-sufficient bobby was really successful so I mean, that was that was a nice relief and uh i was you know look at it i just i'm just happy that i wasn't aborted i'm happy that you know hey at least i was you know at least i'm alive and thank and thank you for you know running thank you kelly for running the you know going through what you had to go through to then yeah the i can't imagine being a parent how tough that would be I can't imagine being a woman how tough that'd be actually physically carry and connect with somebody and then just, you know, say, say, let me, good luck out there. You know, it's gotta be rough. Yeah. I didn't even know to you that you said she was at like Bobby's parents' ranch or something. She was like yeah. living there for like, yeah, yeah, months, through, like through the whole, probably for at least eight months or so. Jeez. That must have been interesting too, because not even like she knew Bobby that well or anything, right? Like, yeah, I know. I yeah, know. and he wasn't there with like her friends or family, no. and there was no like, like how was she connecting with people? Like she was just, yeah, I mean, I, just talking about that now it makes me want to ask her more about that that period, what that was like. Yeah. Because, because supposedly there's uh, there's an actor that was Bobby's brother-in-law, the Bobby's sister was Lita Baron, who became a kind of a movie star back in the late fifties, early sixties, and and she married this cowboy actor, Western actor named Rory Calhoun. And while Kelly was down there, supposedly Rory was like really hitting on her, trying to hook up with her while uh -huh. before she got too pregnant, I guess. So, and that really made Bobby angry at, at uh, Rory, but there's a whole soap opera down there that was going on that, um, you know, that I'd like to ask myself learn a little bit more about. I gotta, I'll give Kelly a call and see if she wants to share about that. Yeah. I talked to her the other day too. That's kind of good, like catching up and stuff. That was nice. Yeah. She's so sweet. Uh, yeah. What was it like growing up? Um, you're, I guess you're, you're different in the sense that you're adopted and um, you see other, other kids with like their, their biological parents. Um, did that have any effect on you? Not really in the sense that when I, when I was first going through like elementary school, my best friend across the street, he was adopted too. So like two, one of my best friends and, and, and the group was adopted. So it just seemed kind of like a normal thing. And when you're that young, you don't really, you don't really process it that much. You don't really reflect. Yeah. I'm going to be affected by this. You're just a kid. You're just, you know, watching TV and not playing and, you know, just doing whatever everybody else did. It was just, Prior to everybody getting divorced and moving away, it was it was pretty happy little family. I loved the Bay Area up there, just the climate and the trees, and it was really it was it was a good place to grow up. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because my my whole um, thought process on that was like, if if you were to get picked on and you were adopted, like someone would be like, oh well, you're you're adopted and like your parents didn't love you, kind of thing, and. Uh, yeah, I, was I just never, never luckily got that. It wasn't really, it wasn't, it never really was an issue. And I never really, I never like was had this hunger to, I've got to find out who my birth parents are. Because I thought that would be kind of disrespectful to my adopted parents. I don't want to make them feel, you know, like, oh, you weren't good enough. I got to find, you know, the other mm -hmm. once, you know, once, once we had kids, it was like, okay, now just even just for medical reasons, you want to find out what your family history is. Are there any things that are going to be passed on genetically that we would should know about? So there's a real, you know, a real need to know versus just out of curiosity, you know? Yeah. I was going to say a similar thing too, like you're saying about how you found out your friend was adopted too. Like that's how I kind of felt like after you guys told me you guys getting divorced in like third grade and like, I went to school, I was just so sad, right? Like I was really sad about all that. But then I realized like, I, had, I knew like, there's a bunch of people who had parents already divorced and stuff. And like, or it was just so common then too. Yeah, especially now, like when we were kids, it was much more common like when you were probably like, right? Oh, yeah. like, definitely 
yeah, it got it's increased. So like after that, like that helped me feel a lot more normal about it. And then like look at more of the positives, like, oh, I'll have like two Christmases, I'll, I'll have two houses, <laughs> and like you know, like I'm still happy that like you were close, obviously. Like we yeah. lived like five like you know, we're in the same like city, like it's like like a yeah. what is it like two miles maybe a mile and a half I don't yeah I was I, I really messed up I, I was a bad I was a bad husband and um you know I could go into too many details now but I just messed things up drugs played a big part of it and um and who knows this is my upbringing possibly too but yeah we made a we made a, a decision and, and we became we basically we separated but we want to keep the family as a unit together and not be like a, a, i like my, my parents, like they would talk, Norma would talk really poorly about Chuck and Chuck wouldn't really say much because he was a nice guy, but so many other, I've seen so many other families where the parents just go, go to become warring factions and talk really yeah. bad. Where we always want to be on the same team and be the best parents we could be to unified in that sense and not be, you know, not be, not be, you know, throwing negativity at each other and trying just to be, not maybe in the same house, but try to be still doing things together, celebrating Christmases together and stuff like that, which, yeah. you know, I think we did a pretty good job of considering, you know, considering everything. Um, you guys, you know, both turned out, who knows what kind of little damages, you know, life gives everybody as far as different things and stuff. And, you know, you never know when you're, you know, especially when you're, it's so weird too, when you drive away from, when you go to the hospital to deliver two kids, you pull up with just car seats and nobody, nobody in them, and then you drive away with two babies from scratch. And like, okay, good luck. You're like, how do you do this? It's like there's, there's you know, there's books and things, but when it comes right down to it, it's it's crazy. You just do your best, and you make mistakes, and you know, you try to make up for your mistakes and try to learn from your mistakes, and yeah. you know, try to be loving and supportive as much as you can. Yeah, and I love like. I appreciate how you guys went about it because I loved it. And I felt like it was very different than a lot of other people or like other people I know, right? Where their parents like hate each other or like it's, they'll never do things with both parents or yeah. it's like, geez, like I can't imagine that. Cause even though like I was mainly living with mom, right? It was like, I still saw you all the time. You still came and like, or took me to all my practices or yeah, you guys were always yeah. at all my games. And like, it was like, I didn't really notice that. Like, it's like, I still saw you all the time. It wasn't like there was like any like, yeah, I came long. Almost every day after work, I'd come over and hang out for a bit too. Yeah, exactly. It just like felt so normal. Like, I got so used to it. It wasn't like you were like gone ever. Yeah. Like I didn't know why. Like yeah, I, I you know I just I just really you know we're really fortunate we were able to find a kind of a happy medium to where it wasn't. Uh, yeah, you know. and obviously it could have been better. Like if we did like stay together or anything else, right? Like I could have been like obviously, but for what happened and like everything else that was going on, right? Like I think it was handled really well. I'm like, I never heard like you or mom never really spoke badly about each other to me or, or Chloe really, like no matter what, like there's never like a thing like, Oh, like fuck him, fuck her. Like it was, it was never like, it was never, it was never like that. And that's what I, I like. And like, it was never made me hold any like grudge against one parent really, or really like hate it more. I was a little like upset at like mom a bit just when we got when the divorce happened because i thought it was like her like kicking you out or something and like i obviously i didn't know any of the details of what was going on right yeah. i just knew you guys weren't together so like that was like you know just a little but then i i got to understand it more the mom reassured me and you were still there so i was like okay i was like all right yeah this is, this yeah. is okay and then the same thing with like the more other people having divorced parents also that helped like just saying okay it's kind of normal it just happens like i don't really know why but whatever like it's okay yeah, it's, 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 um, I mean, it wasn't far from perfect, but it could have been way worse as far as the whole, the whole package and being close by and, uh, luckily I had a job tour. I could leave when I had to, when I wanted to do be at your events and make that a priority. Same with Chloe. So it was like very, very important to put, you know, whatever version of family that we constructed, put that first and then work and everything, you know, came second and, and uh you know still feel that way yeah yeah I, I loved it i love it it was good zach you said you were sad for like a couple of weeks after after your parents divorced how did you overcome that that sadness what was what was that key uh 
Well, I wasn't even like a very sad kid. I was a pretty happy kid, right? Like I was like sports or friends or whatever. Like there was nothing, I was never really sad that much to begin with, but just right away. I remember like when they told me and then I ran up to my room and like kind of shut the door and I was just like crying and like, I was really just like, I didn't believe something, you know what, like, you know what divorce means and that they're like separating and like, I just thought like, oh, like now I'm not gonna, like my parents should be separated. Like I won't see one of them. Like I, I don't even completely know, you know? Cause it was a while ago. I was like eight or nine. I was probably like eight. Yeah. I think it was like eight. I think it was in third grade, the like beginning of third grade. And we were in the Haverford house. We were like down there, right? Like below Pally Elementary. And I think it's more just time, right? Like, cause I also talked to the kids at school and like, it was normal. And then it wasn't like, I didn't see my dad or I like, didn't see my mom. Like I still saw them all the time. So it was just like, I just got used to it. I was like, okay, this is all right. And then like, that's basically it, right? It's like, I couldn't change anything. Hmm. So it was just a bit of time seeing that other kids had similar things then also if I did talk more with them I was like oh my situation is actually a lot better like I actually see my dad all the time or I still my parents don't hate each other like they they will still have dinner together or whatever so a lot like, of people have strict visit, visitation like a, you, know, so you can't see them all during the week but you get them for the weekend it's like a totally truncated kind of lifestyle versus you try to just, uh, make it as normal as possible and I almost saw you I mean the way I kind of rationalized it the best I could was I'd come after work, hang out, have dinner with you guys almost every night, help with homework, play around or whatever. Then you guys get ready for bed and stuff and put you to bed and I would go home. And I was just sleeping elsewhere and then, you know, do the same thing the next day and go to your little league games and go to your basketball games and all that stuff. So, yeah, you know, it, you know, it could have been way worse. And I'm happy it was, we worked out a, a system that, you know, made a, you know, I could make the best of a, of a bad situation. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Yeah. Seems like you handled it pretty well. Um, but like and to be having that kind of conversation with other third graders, right? Well, like it wasn't that deep, right? Like I don't completely remember it, but I remember right. I remember finding out like other people's parents are divorced. And I was like, okay, it's kind of normal. Like it's not like it's not like I'm like the only one, right? Like my dad. Fifty percent. That was the fifty percent of the of the family. Yeah, basically. that's the thing. It was more of it just like becoming normal, and then like I would hear like, you know, just like some people didn't see their dad, or like they didn't see their mom, or like oh, their parents don't like each other, and then like it was like from that I was like oh, like I I was like you know I was like oh this is actually like pretty good, like I don't mm -hmm. think I'm in like such a bad spot, you know? I was just like okay. When did you like, relate at all? Sorry, did you relate when um, were you still friends with Aiden when he went through their thing? Because that was later in life. They were they were friends of ours. And I'm more. still yeah. Obviously, I'm still like friends with Aiden, and we still talk more. But like, I mean, when, when he stopped, when, they, when when he went through his divorce. When, yeah, when no, but when, that's what I'm saying. When we stopped being friends, like not friends. I think when we stopped playing sports together outside, which I can't oh. remember was like if it was a elementary school the end of elementary school middle school remember when mark started we stopped like doing like Bar uh, barrington or whatever so basketball far. kind of like we were at different schools right we didn't have phones or anything so it was like i didn't talk to him as much and we'd right. hang out occasionally just like with like family friends and we saw like rebecca or something but um i didn't i haven't really talked to him too much about that whole situation i know i know a bit about like what happened from mom just like you know because mom's so close with rebecca and stuff Right. So I know I bet that could have been like pretty tough, but he seems like he's doing all all right. He's still, I know he's still close to both of them, at least now. Like he doesn't he doesn't live with them, right? He's like he's out doing his own thing. So right. I don't completely know, but I want to like talk more with him. Like I texted him recently and was saying I, I want to just like go on a phone call or something because we've texted a few times like sporadically, but it, like just actually talk and like just see what what's up, you know? Because we aren't like like super close right now at all. But we were right. It's a preschool. Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm kind of curious how that how that was for for him though. <sighs> Besides art, um, do you have any other interests and hobbies? Uh, let's see. Well, I've been my art is still art. Right? So I've been doing painting now on my like fine art paintings, commercial art stuff, which is fun. 
um, but that's still art. Uh, I, I uh, got involved in politics. Um, to this last campaign, we had a fundraiser with Joe Biden at the house. And uh, through my girlfriend, Lynette, she's friends with the family. And th that whole world was interesting. And been to DC a few times, getting involved with some business over there, um, which is the first time I visited there. And it's really interesting, really architecturally and stuff. It's a pretty cool city. Um, yeah, you know, just, just basic. Uh, my leisure time is a little uh, watching sports. Build, build some mini sports wagering and stuff for the adrenaline of that. It's kind of fun. Um, chess. <laughs> this is right. Still oh. can't get. I can't even break into the seven hundreds, but I'm happy I took Angel down two out of three. Hey, you're still you're still going. It's not over. I know. I still, but I don't, I don't. I don't. I can't get a long run going. But I'm fast. We gotta get you in a little like boot camp. We'll get like uh, some of yeah, our some so. of our top minds, I mean, I, and we'll I, try I, to. I'm running to make some kind of jump, but and I swear the games. The two, almost all three of those games, the Angels. That's one thing I love about chess is like games can be so weirdly different, and they can kind of start out the same. But I like experimenting with different openings just to see, just to try to shake it up. Because so many of the traditional openings, you kind of know all the pre-planned moves. But sometimes just go pure pawn attack. How far you just keep working the pawns up and make them, you know, just make sure they're covered and yeah. just keep going up. It's it's just there's so many multitudes of variations. I just, I just like the way my brain feels after a win and feel like a, the biggest dumbass when I lose. Or like that <laughs> one time you got me with that, that a pawn sitting right next to the queen, and I'm, I'm totally blind to that. I'm looking. I at know else. that that just blows me away. How a man of supposedly vision, vision and you know observation can't see doesn't have that little bit of extra just stamina just to just to check out your angles just it, it, it just fascinates me how you, you perception you just miss things that are right in front of you and that feeling like oh my god it's it's like you get hit with a brick or something it just blows me away and, uh, and you hope other people are going to follow the same track oh they don't see this you know not, so. <laughs> yeah or like when you're about to like lose a queen or do you lose something and then you see it after you release and then you're just like holding your breath for, like a whole <laughs> move yeah. And you're just like, please. please. Or, or you miss one. You go, God, I could have got his clear with that. Yeah, yeah, or you go through the review after, and then you see, yeah. like, it's like, oh, yeah, take the queen here. Or, like, do this. And you just oh. didn't see it for, like, three moves. Or, like, both mm -hmm. you guys didn't see anything. Uh, it's interesting. So what, did, whatever level of fatigue you're at, too, like, if you feel you can play, when you're a little fatigued, how much tougher it is just for your brain to process. Yeah, fatigue. Extra... Or even, like, even your, for me, it's like your mood, too. Yeah. If I'm feeling a little stressed or anxious that day, I know I'm going to lose almost every game. Like, it is totally my mood and my confidence, too, because you can feel it. There's, like, some games where, like, you know, you're playing someone who's, like, better ranking or whatever, and you, they just have to control the whole game. And it's the same start, but they just, like, totally, like... But even the things that you notice now, where you can notice, uh, you know, you can see a fork coming up sometimes, where sometimes yeah. you always fall for it, but, okay, you see it coming, so you can kind of maneuver out of it versus, you know, just having that kind of that kind of like just that repetition of doing it. Exactly, it's almost like exactly. it's a mental muscle that, okay, I know this is coming. I know this is coming, but then, then you take that and multiply it to guys who can see 10 moves down the board, what they're trying to do. Yeah. Then they just do like, if they do, it's even a different opening. You do like an E4 and they do like a, like a Sicilian or like what, they do it's a different opening. You're like, what, what do I do now? Like, what, <laughs> what are they trying to do? And then you're trying to understand what they're doing, but then like, that's what they want, right? You're just yeah. like, you're going, you're totally doing like, working on them and then they have control and you're trying to like go to their moves it's like a whole mind game yeah what kind of was it from the queen's gambit that got i know we watched that and got more fired up or were you playing before that because that's one thing about COVID. it's like chess is a great thing to be stuck in you know when you're stuck in a place just to be able to do it especially online yeah, but is that we got everybody going you think it was a few things for me uh before I just thought about how like I had a lot of good friends that I like, right? But they're separate. They don't know each other, right? I have like the LA friends and even some of those I like basketball friends or like other friend groups, right? And then I had like a bunch of friends up here in Seattle that I really love too. And I'm like, you know, there's a bunch of good guys, but like they're never gonna actually know each other. Like, how would that even right. happen? And then it was watching Queen's Gambit, but then it was like and then like loving it and then starting to get really into chess again and like. Angel told me about the show too with, with you, Dad. And then like he Angel loved it and like it hasn't even played chess ever before, really. Um, 
And then it was when I got the, the false positive like COVID test and I got like two negatives after, right? But like I was quarantining in the, in the, the room at your house and I couldn't leave for the whole weekend. So I was just right. in there like alone, like just with school and like couldn't see anyone. And I was just in there. And it was like during that time that like it kind of clicked, like chess club could be kind of fun. Like invite all my friends, like we play some chess, like and get better doesn't like it's just everyone all my friends can get to know each other like all know everyone and like zoom so easy now like i can just yeah. throw up a zoom meeting and like invite anyone i want and like just see what happens and i was like there's not really a downside to doing it but yeah. what happens it doesn't work but then like i tried it's like the same thing with me and chris doing the youtube channel thing we're doing right now the podcasting it's like it, we both thought it was a good idea and then it's just like but then, like, for me, it was, like, I thought it was a good idea. And I was, like, why not? Why not? Like, why? Like, what am I waiting for, right? And, like, we are in COVID, too. So, it's, like, I can't see all these friends anyway. It's, like, you have to call each of them individually or, like, try to reach out. But now I can just make, like, a singular, like, weekly event. And, like, anyone can come. Anyone's invited. Bring whoever. Play yeah. some chess. Hang out. And I was, like, that sounds pretty cool. Like, and I got all into it and, like. It's like my posts all early. I did a bunch of posts and stuff and like invite everyone and got like the Kobe versus LeBron playing chess as the <laughs> background. Like that made it look nice. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. Some of your friends, so this, the, the level that some of those guys are at, the way they discuss yeah. it, it's like blows me away. It's oh. like, Same. Uh, I still can't remember more than like two, three opening names. <laughs> like and I, to actually know what they are. Like it's still so hard for me. Like I, I can't, like, I know a few. I don't like, you know, you can do like the, uh if you do like sicilian to respond to like e4 right or if you can do like the dutch which is the opposite if you open like queen side pawn then you do the opposite sicilian kind of thing or there's like but who's the one friend who is like this his analysis he, he's like the brainiest i think when he's describing certain certain strategies and aspects of moves like he's the guy i think with, i think the guy with the, with the golden gate bridge behind him tom the tom? Tom, he the... tom ruffin Tom, the yeah, one that Tom won uh, the UW tournament. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, Tom won the UW turn in a real tournament. But then, other like Hunter, who recently joined from the tournament, who they played in the finals. He's also a beast. And then probably the third one who hasn't been there as recently is Brian. Uh -huh. And Brian's like, I still have never beaten him. Like, it is like he's just so good. Like he is so smart. Like I like them three. Like their analysis like is just good. I can actually beat Tom. Like I've beaten Tom a few times. Really. Yeah, and then, like, with uh, Brian, actually, it's funny, like, remember, like, a game mode, like, King of the Hill, or whatever, there's, like, a different game mode, you get your king to the first to the middle, and, like, in that, me and Brian are even, like, we're even in that game, like, because it's a different strategy, right, and, like, so that's, like, kind of, I always feel good to beat Brian in that. Um, <laughs> but then you got guys like Jake, you're, like, talking smack and cocky and all that stuff, and it's so funny. It's so I know, I know, Jake's so good for it, he loves it. <laughs> Oh, he loves it. Background sometimes. Or <laughs> yeah, when you grab the picture. <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad, like, everyone's, like, getting along. And, like, it's just, it's, it's like, I'm happy, right? And, like, now, like, me and Chris and, like, Tom and like, Paul and uh, Angel and then Matt. Matt only came a few times, but, like, I want to bring Matt, too. But we're, and now we're going to Lake Tahoe together over spring break. It's next week. We're going oh, that's to great. friends that met through that's, the chess club. You're going to love it there. Plus, oh, God, I'm, that's so, right close to those, that little uh, little town right on the Nevada side of Lake Tahoe. It's got, we saw, we saw David Spade there back when you were babies. He went to that place up in uh, the timeshare up in Tahoe. Yeah. That's what we're going to the time share. Yeah, it's, great. it's so nice. And, oh, sweet. Uh, yeah, no, that's that, that's the thing too. Like, uh, Tom is actually from Reno, oh, so he perfect. knows the whole area. So he'll he'll give us he'll probably show us all the cool shit, right? Oh, so that'd be great. Yeah, so I'm ex I'm excited. Chris is going. Chris is. How many know, guys are going? Excited. That's gonna be awesome. How many people are going? Six of us. Six. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, so we have a how many how many days are you going for the whole week? I think it's like four or five days. Nice. I can't remember if it's four nights or five nights. Are you flying to Reno? Me, Matt, and Paul are flying to Reno. And then Tom actually comes down this weekend to go to Reno because he's going to go visit his family. And then Angel and Chris are driving from <laughs> L.A. 
and they're gonna go the night before because mom got them like a little extra night like it's just a two-bedroom place uh-huh. and then they're gonna pick us up in the morning and then we're gonna be there uh next wednesday oh, that's, so that's gonna be sweet nice yeah so that's good um yeah, I, was, I wanted to say, uh, Chris, though, Chris has improved a lot at chess, like, since, since doing it. Like, did you even play much before, Chris? Like, no, remember. not really. Um, I played a little bit when I was younger with my brother. Um, yeah. But, like, whenever I would play him, he, he wouldn't take it easy on me. So, like, it would be one of those, like, where he wins and, like, I knock down all the pieces and I, <laughs> I go cry kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so, like, I never really got to learn chess. I, I knew how, like, the pieces moved. Um, the strategy. But, like, yeah, um, I didn't know like you wanted like the you wanted to control the center or um, I would just kind of like mess around with the pieces and just like what if I do this kind of thing, you know? Um, it's everyone, yeah. Right, but now um, I've been doing a lot of the puzzles recently, like the daily puzzle. I do that, um, and then I do like the um, the puzzle rushes, puzzle battles, and stuff like puzzle that. Puzzle rushes are tough. Yeah, so I've been doing that, and I think that's really improved um, my. Uh, my skill in chess. Why don't yeah. we see, I, I think we should maybe wrap this up and I can, I can do a part two where we get into more grand you're, details. You're fine. Yeah, you're good. Like we can do whatever later or I mean, don't do more about later, wrap it up. Like, pick a section and dive into, you know, different aspects. So I've got, I got hundreds of stories, but um, yeah, I've got some stuff I've got to take care of here for, for work. And I wanted to read my statement from Chloe. It's her birthday today also. I'm going to read a little they just to do her, her justice, and you should definitely get her on this. Yeah. Um, do you want me to mention how it's important as a business with a bunch of employees to be aware of implicit biases within the office and how important it is to always keep Black liberation at the forefront? I'll stand by that. Thank you, Chloe. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good message. Thanks for, thanks for having me on your uh, number two episode. Hopefully. Well, this is the first one with a person, though. You're the first guest. Ah, I- because me and Chris have the intro. Are you going to have uh, try to have a guest every week if possible? Well, we we'll actually have we have one tomorrow planned, so we're going to do that. But it's oh, with Coach Hayes. Is that Co- Coach yeah, Hayes? Yeah, Coach Hayes tomorrow. Uh, I can't wait to see that. When do you get? What, how, what's your lag time between recording and posting? Uh, we're going to see. I don't think it should be that long. Like we're going to maybe try it even today. Like like we'll see. We we, we want to try to do it fast, right? But we're we're both figuring it out, right? We don't. We've never done YouTube or anything like this before, so. You know, it's at, and we're both like in our senior year of college. Yeah, like yeah. it's busy, but we'll figure it out. Like we'll, we'll get it up quick. Hopefully before at least Coach Hayes is tomorrow, either tonight or uh, tomorrow morning. But I have a few friends I'm gonna hang out with. And I got my lab done in this like birthday, right? We're gonna yeah. What, are you going out tonight? No, I'm gonna have a. I think it's like four friends come over, and mom sent me some cake mix. We're gonna make a cake. Play some video games, listen to music, and, and I have other friends. The package, the package is coming there by nine, so you can even. Yeah, leave. no, I'll be here. I'm. We're gonna hang out here, and then I want to. But I have some other friends who live like throughout U District. I want to like bring them like a piece of cake. Like I want to oh, go nice. by and like slide a piece of cake. Everyone gets like a piece of cake, and I'll try to like. I think that'd be fun, and like to do that would feel nice, and like drive around some music. We have someone like handing out my, cake. See, like party hats and uh, blowers, all that stuff. Yeah, too. we we'll might. Do we might just go crazy. Like we'll see. It'll be, it'll be fun. So I'm excited. All right, uh, cool. I think that'll be fun, right? And I'm probably after this, it's gonna like help me get this video up, and then just start setting that that up for tonight. So that'll be fun. All right. Well, thanks for having me as your first guest. I appreciate. Thank it. Thank you for yeah. coming on. Um, I think you have a lot to share and. <laughs> um yeah um i'm looking forward to part two if you yeah, uh if oh, definitely you, Let's yeah see. book it thanks dad like i really okay. do and even you going more in depth on stuff too like i love to hear yeah. all the details and I like at times i think it's really though motivational though because like imagine for someone who does come from like not who doesn't have money or like comes from like a little small town or like whatever like i think it's just inspirational like where you came from too and what happened with like chuck right you guys just like left and like all that it's like yeah. and then your other like personal issues whatever to where you're at now like it, it really is like just powerful you know what i mean like well, not every, just, i mean there's sections within sections obviously you can dive into but this is kind of a broad stroke thing. yeah every section has way more detail obviously yeah of course but i think it's powerful like uh yeah that's why i think like starting this too is we have to record these conversations just for like a random person to see this i think could be like you know, it could be motivational, right? It really is. 
like how you've been saying like how the quote i wrote down too like learning to love to do the things that people hate like to like, become like successful almost you know yeah you have and to like embrace the things that be, you have to do what other people are not like to do really you have to you know it comes down to it's like and anything else be a sports yeah like, how, many, how many hours you put into it you know it exactly nasty. how much you want it and like really i feel like it's building up those habits that the consistent habit of like improving yourself and first like realizing what you want to do and then realizing okay this is more this is what i want to sanction off this time every day to really like focus on that and that's like you right now with the painting too right like you now you're trying to go into painting so now you're painting yeah. every day because you realize what it takes yeah just to knock stuff out like i think that's like super important yeah it is it's consistency with anything it's consistency basically yeah exactly all right i think right. that's pretty good all right. All right. Thanks, Thanks Dad. Guys. Glad you came Love on. You. Uh, yeah, I think we're good. Okay. All right. All right. Peace. Love you. See you later. See ya. See you Love you. See ya.